Welcome to Lumix Festival 2020. For 10 days now, we focus on 10 different topics, one topic every day. And today I myself can't, really can't believe it. It's already our ninth day. We had so many interesting discussions, so many great insights and inspirations that I actually now think a digital festival is not the same than an analog one, but it's definitely worth doing it. But we are not at the end already. Um, Lumix Festival is still going on and we've got two more days and two more important topics to discuss. Today, we want to focus on the question of equality. But we are all the same. Unfortunately, it is not that simple. And the answer to the question of equality has to face that racism, sexism and othering are part of a certain world order that was built up over centuries and is still effective today. The topic of equality, or rather inequality, runs through the work of Belgian photographer Sanne de Wilde, like a red line. Sanne, good to have you here, and thanks for joining. Even if it was a bit stressful to be here on time, we are very happy to have you here, and thanks for taking part in this year's Lumix Festival. Thank you so much. Today's live talk will be moderated by Miriam Slobinski. So welcome Miriam as well. Welcome. Miriam is a trained journalist, a researcher, curator, picture editor and writer based in Berlin right now. Currently she's working on her PhD at the Humboldt University in Berlin with a thesis titled The Political Image in Photojournalism based on the example of the magazine Stern, a critical approach to the collective visual memory. Before I hand over to Miriam as our moderator for today now, I just give you a brief introduction of how this thing is going to work. Most of you might already know. We disabled your audio, but of course you're welcome to interact and to ask all your questions and to give your comments into the chat box down here and we will take care of them, curate them and we'll include them into the discussion later. Yeah, so that's the main important thing. Also, the people on YouTube are welcome to um, ask questions and put questions into the chat box there and we will include them um, into our discussion here on Zoom. Yeah, so welcome everybody and please Miriam and Sane, you may start. Thank you very much, Karen, for your introduction. Thank you, Lumix Festival, for having us here. And a warm welcome to everybody out there, and especially to our guest, Sanne de Wilde. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Sanne to you. Sanne de Wilde studied and graduated with a mild star in fine arts at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Kent. I hope I pronounce it <laughs> quite right. With great honors in 2012. Her photo series, The Dwarf Empire, was rewarded in the same year with the Photo Academy Award. And she was awarded then afterwards with the Nikon Press Award in 2014 and in 2016 for most promising young photographer. The British Journal of Photography selected her as one of the best emerging talents from around the world in 2014. That's only two years after her graduation, just to remember. She received the Firecracker Grant 2016 and the PH Women's Grant. Uh, so two uh, prizes for women in photography. And most recently won a World Press Photo Award for her collaborative project with her colleague and um, photographer Benedicte Kurzen for Land of EBG last year. She has been internationally published, so you had the chance to see her work at The Guardian, New Yorker, and so on. And her work traveled as well as an exhibition nearly around the world. So you had the chance to see her at AL or at the Circulation, Lagos, and Wuj Photo Festival. I forget for sure a lot, <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, it's uh, too much, but I'm so curious to see and hear more to dive into the work of Sanne and for her, from herself. So um, last thing I want to mention that she since 2013 works for the Volksklan in the Netherlands as a photographer. And um, she is a member of the newer agency 
also based in Amsterdam since 2017. So again, warm welcome to you, Zanna. Uh, and um, yeah, please put during the talk also your questions already in the Q&A box. We will have an eye on them. First, um, what came to your, my mind, and I would like to ask it um, at, at, at first question and briefly maybe is your answer, I don't know. Um, I, I would know how did you come to photography as your medium because you studied at the Academy of Fine Arts and there are a lot of ways to express um, thoughts and, um, um, and typical things uh, in, in the arts. So why did you choose photography? I think that's a really good and important question because um, it has been kind of an ongoing search for many years to find what would be the right medium to express or to try to document the world or try to yeah tell stories that I found important. And uh, I, I went to Steiner School when I was in, in, in high school. So always did a lot of creative uh, work, but so many things that I wasn't really sure what my path was to be. And first, I actually did a lot of theater and I was very interested in this medium of storytelling because you really create from a pure form. You start from nothing and you create with words and then images come out of that in a, you know, not a, not a photographic way, but in the end you build up images on a scene. And I could also envision telling, telling stories that way, but I always struggled a lot with the gap between the audience and the performer. And I, I struggled with the per, like the repetitive aspect of performing the same performance and, and maybe finding little freedom within that. Although now, of course, the theater landscape has also changed a lot and there's a lot of filmic theater and, and much more image-based theater. But when I was still studying, there was still a lot of text theater and and you still had this big black hole that was the audience and then you had the stage that was higher from which you were kind of looking down at people you were trying to exchange with and I didn't feel comfortable with that medium in that regard and I, and I think I, I was looking for a medium that was where, where the, the, the distance between people that you were trying to share a story with and yourself as storyteller and people that you know were part of the story where I could somehow connect that more closely. And I actually studied painting first. So I didn't uh, initially started uh, f studying photography because I also saw painting as a very pure form of creation, but then again, felt limited by, you know, spending most of the time in a, in a studio by myself and, and not really being able to interact with the world in a very direct way. And I think all of those processes eventually led me to photography, which is a tool that, yes, there's still a gap sometimes between you and, and people you're working with or people that then get to view the story. And there's a lot of stuff in between that you need to somehow bridge and find a way to, to process your images and your story through. But it is a, a, a medium that allows you to get very close to people and very close to stories you want to tell. Um, so I think that was my path towards photography. And then within that scheme of photography, I tried to find new ways and also interactive ways or more installation based ways to make, you know, also simply the experience of an exhibition more inclusive or interactive in some way. And this is, I think, a very big challenge that I still, you know, I'm only at the beginning of trying to tackle or trying to work with. Yeah, but it's uh, it's great. Um, I, I think we should at this moment um, um, start uh, to see your pictures as well because um, it makes much more sense that we have your work as well here uh, and be present with your pictures. Um, maybe we can dive a bit into your projects um, you have prepared by all. Um, uh, that means more. Um, how did you um, come to your project and what, what are the thoughts behind it? Like your graduation project was the Dwarf Empire, when mm -hmm. I'm right. And um, yeah, and um, I'm, I noticed you uh, reflecting a lot about the medium and as well um, the people in front of the camera. So uh, maybe we can start with the, the presentation and um, see, I think, your first project. Um, maybe we can just click and go on. I think the, the presentation is kind of a brief overview of several projects. Mm -hmm. Not all projects are in there. So uh, it doesn't start chronologically. It doesn't start with the Dwarf Empire, but starts with 
um, work I've been doing, I've been working with people living with albinism for about 10 years now. And this is actually a project that already started before I uh, uh, went to China to do the dwarf empire. And how this work originated is I, uh, I had an assignment for school, for the art academy um, to uh, do a story in a school. Mm -hmm. And I went to a school for blind children because being a photographer, working with the medium and the eye being your main tool to see or to document or to envision, I was very, very curious on how people that, um, uh, how, how people that don't have access to this, this kind of vision to seeing would experience the world, translate the world, feel the world. And I was very curious to see, you know, life or, or reality from that different perspective and in that school for blind children I met a boy uh, with albinism and that was actually my first encounter and that was the origin of this project where uh, I, I started researching a bit and discovered that in Belgium there was not really an organization at that point to support people living with albinism or to help young parents that had a child living with albinism. So I, I tried to see photography as a tool to perhaps uh, bring people together. I started making portraits and those are the Snow White portraits uh, on where I, I try to literally translate this idea of the uh, lack of pigmentation, the fragility of the, the skin, the physical fragility, and at the same time, the very powerful presence of these people's spirit and, and uh, their beauty and just everything that could kind of transcend being seen as uh, uh, lacking something or, or having suffering from a certain condition that has a lot of consequences for them in terms of um, uh, being very prone to skin cancer, being extremely sensitive to light, um, having limited vision and um, that I wanted to somehow literally translate in this uh, and how photography um, can play a role in translating that. And at the same time, already walking the line of this balance of how do you, how, how can photography empower and, and show this fragility without, um, uh, I mean, in these images of Snow White, you see people being almost consumed by the light. That is also what happens in reality. They're so um, sensitive to the light that this is really something they uh, have to live with. Uh, and I wanted to also, it was a reference to the photographic qualities of the medium photography, where normally when you expose an image to light in the dark room, the longer you expose it, the darker it becomes. It completely you know, disappears in the dark. And here in these portraits, the opposite happened. The more you expose people to the light, the more their whiteness almost, you know, seem to, they seem to be consumed by the light. So all of those elements were little things I tried to touch upon within this series. And then I would organize uh, a, a kind of gathering with all the people I portrayed. And it was a way for them also to meet each other, talk to each other, and for young parents to be in touch with much older people, much more experienced people, and to have this exchange. And then later I started expanding this project also to the Netherlands, as the Volkskrant also asked me to do a project. And I discovered there's a village in the Netherlands with a high percentage of alpinism. Uh, which had to do also with um, uh, it being a very religious community and the geographical, uh, uh, the geographics of the place being kind of isolated also during history. The village had been kind of cut off from other places, which explained why there was maybe a higher incidence of people with albinism, as it is a genetic condition that is passed on uh, where both parents have to be carrier. I also did a project in Polynesia about that because one of the people I portrayed for Snow White, she told me her mom was Polynesian and she said there was a high occurrence of albinism on the island and that people there had very little access to any kind of help or support. Um, and there the project also became uh, traveling to a lot of schools, talking to directors of the schools, talking to people about the situation and discovering that 
there was not so much uh, the exclusion of people or the or the even extreme violence like you have it in in countries like Tanzania where it's still a very very difficult and dangerous situation for people living with albinism and there's a lot of ex discrimination and a lot of prejudice on Polynesia I found there was not that kind of prejudice the problem was more ignorance and people's not knowing how to protect children living with albinism or how to support people uh, in a way that could protect them and then the last Last part, which is actually what the presentation started with, is uh, uh, my latest chapter that I started working on in Nigeria when we were in Nigeria for the twin project, Land of Ibeji, where I, I, I focused mainly on young women living with albinism. And uh, as um, models with albinism were coming up more and more often and, and being actually kind of presented in the fashion industry in, in, in the context of diversity models. I was really curious to hear people's thoughts on that and, 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 and investigating kind of photography as an empowering tool. I wanted to have the conversation with the women there that I photographed to, to talk about is photography actually a medium that can empower and how can it empower and when do you feel empowered so I would um, uh, use the the visuals kind of a fashion photography street fashion photography I would play with those aesthetics and then um, in collaboration with the women I photographed, let them write and, and speak about which images could be empowering to them, how they felt and thought about that, and organized also a panel in collaboration with the African Artist Foundation in Lagos, where I was not part of the conversation, but there was a representative of the Foundation for Albinism in Lagos. There were two of the ladies who I photographed and also a Nigerian photographer who had done a project on people living with albinism, where they had a conversation about the current situation in Nigeria, how they feel um, uh, the experiences are for people living with albinism and in the bigger perspective, how photography could be or couldn't is not succeeding to be a tool for empowerment. So that is kind of my ongoing research and process in the in this work uh, where you now saw a few images of. So you're a real communicator with the camera, like uh, you enhance all of these aspects of how they're presented, how your presentation can uh, take part in a, in, a, in a dialogue, in a process, in a discourse. Um, what I'm interested in personally is um, what was the feedback of the persons you photographed? Like they're looking so, for me, they're looking so beautiful, but what was their own, um, yeah, their own uh, feedback to you? It's always a very tricky thing with photography because also you're, when you, I mean, I never saw photography as a, as a way to portray a person. So I would never, um, uh, think I could capture someone's essence or uh, for me it's an kind of a visual research or investigation to portraying an ID and as I explained a little bit what the ID was in the chapter that I did in Nigeria in collaboration with the organization there or the chapters I've been doing in the Netherlands in Belgium in Polynesia it's always uh, uh, it's always different because cultures are very different, communities are very different, the way they've been dealing with it is very different. And sometimes, uh, to me, things also come as a surprise. For example, when we did the panel debate in, uh, in Nigeria, since the situation is much, much safer there for people, and there's not that kind of discrimination towards people living with albinism, like in Tanzania, for example, uh, I was still surprised to see that in the conversation, the audience that was there, which is an audience that often visits exhibitions or is kind of like culturally educated. I don't know if that's the correct way of saying it, but people that are, you know, also invested in the art scene and, and that are, um, are part of many conversations about arts, about maybe even representation. A lot of people there were very surprised to hear pe people's personal testimonies and experiences. So I found that, you know, it's always just the tip of the iceberg. I never, I mean, there's so much to be done in terms of equality and, and understanding. And so it always feels like just a, a little drop of something, but at the same time, it, it is uh, to not completely lose courage in undertaking these these kind of sensitive topics, stories, or, or, or projects, you do feel that sometimes just creating 
a platform or a space for a conversation does um, uh, create space for people to be heard. And uh, as we are now moving on in the presentation mm -hmm. of the Dwarf Empire, let me maybe quickly touch upon that project. Um, as you kind of introduced, it is um, connected with all the other work in that sense that it again speaks about a community that due to certain genetic condition or due to certain genetics, um, uh, their life or, or their experiences are, are, are influenced or shaped in a certain way. And in the context of otherness and othering, they are looked at in a, and framed in a specific way. This project is quite difficult to show in just a few images because it's a very complicated and, and again, sensitive topic. It's also not just about genetics and people living with dwarfism, but very much about the concept of the human zoo, uh, which is also something I researched by going to look for remains of that in Ghent, where I actually studied and where one of the world exhibitions was held with the Congolese village. Um, Congolese village was, was an extreme example of the, the human zoo where people are being exhibited and, and, and framed in a certain way where they're kind of supposed to pretend to live their life and people come and see them as a, as a, as a show, as a human exhibition. I feel like the, the, the presentation is skipping very fast from one image to the other. So maybe that's a bit confusing for people who are watching. I would maybe slow it down a little bit while moving from one image to the next. Um, but uh, uh, at the Dwarf Empire, as I said, it was a, the Dwarf Empire is actually a translation of the, the Chinese name of the place, which is a place that was founded by a tall man who wanted to create uh, a, a space for people living with dwarfism to be able to work and make a living. And, and to be able to provide that, he created a kind of theme park, uh, a show where people perform, but they are not really performing based on their personal talents, but they are kind of managed and dressed in a certain way and are performing a show that is not uh, really their own story or their own choice, which makes it very complicated because I've been there several times and, and tried to have a conversation with the people there in which I found that it was very hard to have people speak very openly or bluntly about their experience because as you know, China is a very censored um, place. I mean, people, you can really be um, taken up upon words if you speak out or speak up about things. So um, what I try to do is I try to gather a lot of material. I, for example, what we're looking at now are portraits of people costumized. So this is really how they're being presented by the park. This is their kind of persona, how they're being dressed up and how they are expected to perform a show twice a day. Um, but I also spend a lot of time with them in their living environment. They live in housing very close to the park and um, uh, the housing is adapted to their needs, but let's say in the bare min minimum, I think for sure much more could be done to uh, support them. But in the bigger context of living in China with um, uh, this kind of condition, talking to the people there, it is quite hard for them to find a safe environment to work and live in. And people were very, kind of proud or happy to be able to contribute to their families back home and to make a living to have an earning and uh, because I, I, I gathered um, pictures that they took from their environment and from their selves because I was trying to see how they would like to be seen how they would portray themselves how they would present themselves uh, also without this customized context I asked them to write letters to me in which they which I asked them to speak about their experience about how they felt living in the place what this place meant for them and often in the letters and also in some of the conversations that I had uh, when I went back a second time with the translator they often uh, described this place as a kind of paradise um, uh, or a place where they feel like they feel to experience some kind of belonging and being surrounded by people that are like them and, and having found a family of people that truly understand them. At the same time, the, um, the reality of the place is quite grim. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated situation also to understand as a visitor. 
Um, there's, you know, they're constantly being photographed, being documented also by people that sometimes are not really polite or friendly. It is, of course, a kind of human exhibition in which they are not, yeah, where it's, things are not fully respectful or uh, people are not just able to, yeah, live life the way maybe, yeah, they could if there was more support system for them to do that in a different way. So it's very difficult to um, know what to think about this place. So I always presented the project as an accumulation of images. And one part of the book is actually pictures they took of me. So the roles are reversed and instead of because this project is very much about voyeurism and looking at the other and how do we frame the other and how can we open up that frame or that box. Um, when I arrived there, I found, I mean, it was my first time in China, I'd never been there, but arriving to the park, people were constantly photographing me or constantly wanted to take <laughs> pictures of me, which actually contributed a lot to the project and the understanding of what it feels like to be this obje objectified you know, human being or being framed by a camera constantly and existing within that frame or being forced into that frame. And um, um, it, I think it, it, what I'm always trying to look for in my work is to find a way to somehow, um, uh, yeah, inspire people to understanding or empathy um, through experience and, and through my own experience of constantly being framed and photographed and at some point hiding with them in those little houses because people are just pushing their babies in your arms, pulling your sleeve to, to, to frame you and to photograph you. It did give an entire different layer to the project and contributed to all the different layers of their images of the place, their images of themselves, the letters they wrote, the, the customized portraits, but also the images in their living environment, the brochure of the park, uh, a, a DVD of a, of a couple, a wedding video of a couple that got married and, and where the, the moment where they actually got married was missing so it's kind of the happy <laughs> ending there which was also kind of partly the message in this story and contributed to this lost in translation feeling this trying to communicate on different levels in different ways and somehow trying to understand this story and, and this reality um yeah so you, that is, yeah you, sorry i don't want to okay. interrupt you <laughs> um, um, as, as you mentioned that uh, like it's all about like um, yeah changing the perspective uh, showing all the different layers on on, on this topic or on the situation um, there was uh, already a question I would uh, combine it even with the thought I had when you were, were talking like um, um, have, you do a lot of research I know but um, uh, have you got like influences by other artists or photographers do you uh, like um, yeah like somehow like the work of Diane Arbus or others that they are like how they are dealing with it and how maybe you can in, in relationship to that, um, find your own uh, voice, a visual voice, or is it nothing that you're like um, dealing with in, uh, in the preparation? Well, uh, of course, we are all kind of shaped by where we grew up. And for example, my dad's a photographer, which is also mm -hmm. the reason why I never wanted to <laughs> be a photographer. But obviously, we all have our also cultural biases, but also just, you know, things we've seen, things we grew up with. But I think the, the way the stories came onto my path and also kind of connected is the Dwarf Empire also has a part that is completely different from all the other stories. Because as I said, there's this aspect of the human zoo. There's this, you know, focus on voyeurism and, and how to, you know, deal with that. What is our role as a photographer? Changing that position also, being put on the other side of the camera. Um, I think... Um, uh, yeah, I think a big change now, um, and, and, and for me that change came during, while I was doing my work, is to find a more, find a way to include the people that are the story more into the storytelling, which I think I didn't see so much, for example, in Diane Arbus's work or, um, uh, but this is something that, I mean, when I was graduating, it was, some people really criticized the fact that I wanted to use images that I didn't shoot, yeah. right? That were shot by the people themselves or images of me that were taken by, it was still 
I still also grew up with this idea of you are the photographer and you frame something and that needs to be done with a good camera and otherwise it's not valid as a photographer <laughs> presentation. Um, and I think now, because also with Noor, we, we, thanks to Nikon, we have the opportunity to teach a lot of workshops worldwide that um, uh, Nikon pays for or sponsors us to do. So we can really include people that otherwise can also not afford to do this kind of photographic schooling. I see so much of people including those kind of materials. While when I was studying, I, I didn't really see much of that. So. I think we all constantly, you know, in and 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 maybe some of my work or some of my approach by now is also outdated and has to be completely re, you know, envisioned and reframed. And I have to really identify with how my you know my approach as a my approach as a photographer or story, storyteller is. But I feel like that's also the interesting part of this time. Everything is developing so quickly with the, you know, the photographic medium that is changing, the tools that are changing, the technicals that are changing, but also the conversation about it. And there being much more awareness about like, what is our position as a storytelling, storyteller, sorry. And, and for me, I think this is also part of the process uh, of constantly trying to um, even in simply in the aesthetics of my work, although there are re reoccurring things like color, uh, every project will look a bit different and is also necessary for me to to re-envision my own work. Yeah, okay. and kind of the, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I took it a bit in a different direction, but. No, no, it's super fine. I was a bit, uh, I, I saw the picture of the island of the colorblind and I'm <laughs> always in the first moment. Uh, uh, uh positive shock because I love the picture so much. Mm -hmm. And it's the first, um, I don't, um, it's the first for me when somebody says Sanne de Bilde, um, then um, uh, the island of the colorblind is present. But I think there's a better connection uh, to the next project than, <laughs> than my way. Um, you mentioned like the, this dealing with the collaborative aspect and um, in the island of the colorblind, um, you strongly reflect the medium and the use of photography um, with different layers and uh, different ways, like the, uh, you have uh, black and white, you have infrared and hand painted material. And uh, can you um, um, explain a bit more about um, all the layers um, um, you worked out here um, to, to show so, um, us about? Also to, maybe to add, like uh, often the project I did didn't allow a lot of research, like mm -hmm. it was with the Dwarf Empire with the island of the colorblind but also the work i did in polynesia because it was very hard definitely some years back when there was not social media wasn't so strongly positioned there was not a lot of internet in in isolated places like the island it was very difficult to get in touch with people beforehand or to get a lot of find a lot of research how i found this story uh, the island of the colorblind is actually not because of the book of Oliver Sacks, although I do reached out to him and um, and and got tried to get in touch with him, but at that point he was already severely ill, um, and and I couldn't speak to him anymore. But for people who don't know, he wrote a book called uh -huh. The Island of the Colorblind, and some of his text is also uh, in in my book that I made, The Island of Colorblind. And then there is also text reflecting on the work he did by. Uh, uh, the curator Azuna Bogu, who is the founder of the African Arts Foundation. So it's always a puzzle. And there's also a text in the book written by Rul van Hils, who is the one who introduced me to the story, who, who has acromatopsia, who is Belgian, and who heard me speak about the ra on the radio on, on my work uh, in Polynesia and said, I have a story for you. And he told me the story of the island. And often when people frame this work online, or sometimes I see it pass in Instagram posts, people often write that I, you know, created images to show how people with achromatopsia or complete colorblindness see the world. But this is not what the work is. What I tried is, is an attempt to create a metaphorical image that can invite people to see um, uh, the, the richness in the diversity of vision in how we all see the world differently and how the absence of something or something that can be described as a lack or as a, um, uh, yeah, a condition that it actually can also just be a way to rediscover the world, to see the world differently. And it, an absence of something doesn't mean that there's no other things that, you know, um, uh, can teach people, teach us that 
us color seeing people um, uh, how the world can be redesigned or how, for example, simple things like when you really get into color blindness, you realize that all the street lights are red and green while there's a huge amount of the population that does not see red and green or cannot distinguish those two colors. But the island of the colorblind is very specifically about achromatopsia, which is complete colorblindness. So it means the, the total absence of color, although there are people that do say that they see color sometimes, for example, when they see a very bright sunset or so it's just it's a it's a mystery, the mystery of vision, the mystery of the mind, and and just pointing out how much of what we see and think is perception. And what if we can rock some of those foundations and completely, you know, open up the world to seeing it uh, in all its diversity and, and not in absence of something. And uh, that's what I try to do with those three different approaches of images, um, black and white, because it is said that people with achromatopsia see the world in shades of gray. Um, at the same time, I was imagining that if you see the world in shades of gray, um, but for example, super bright yellow in black and white, it's just white. It doesn't do anything. But um, I could imagine that if you see the world in shades of gray, you're not distracted by, for example, those bright colors or even textures would change. And that's where also the infrared came in. Like, how can I... Uh, create a metaphorical image of what the world could look like in a colorblind mind. So I'm not saying that I can somehow translate what people see because we all don't know if we see the same. And that is also kind of the magic of it, um, which kind of rocks our foundations of <clears throat> how certain ideas are put into our head and how even, you know, when it comes to seeing people as different, this is all perception. This is all how things are being framed and installed and, and, and it's part of also conditioned thinking. And this project in kind of a colorful way tries to, um, by highlighting a very specific story in a very specific place that hosts the highest number of people living with achromatopsia, um, kind of yeah, create a colorful image of, of a different worldview. Um, and that's how, where the infrared images came in, where also for me it became a total, you know, investigation to what does color mean in my photography? What if I lose control over color? Because I had the camera converted to infrared, but never used it before I set foot on the <laughs> island. So I really didn't know what the result would look like. I had never seen an image shot by that camera. So I, I for me, it was also completely rediscovering while shooting kind of um, creating a certain blind spot in terms of my photography to then, you know, be able to to make that part of the process of of, uh, of documenting this place or this story, and then I wanted to find a way to actually be able to, and not only because of course I did interviews and conversations with people, I wanted to also almost literally be able to apply their vision onto the images. And that's when I invited people with achromatopsia to paint over my black and white images. So with watercolors, they could fill in the images and, and recolor them and recolor their own reality without having any knowledge of which colors are what. And this also often uh, uh, connected them to very kind of intimate and personal experiences. While uh, for a lot of people, the moment where they're first confronted with the fact they do not see the world the same as other people or they do not distinguish color is when they're in kindergarten and they're drawing and someone points out that the sun is not purple and that they're doing something wrong. And I wanted to empower that process by saying, no, there is nothing wrong with the colors you use. Actually, it, it, it can inspire other people to, you know, let go of some kind of rigid construction in which we see how things should look or how people should be seen and and um, and and through that process invite each other to that conversation and then I um, after having the photo material working on the book with the, the photo paintings the black and white image the infrared images I created an interactive installation which is a room where you're invited in as a color seeing person and you're surrounded by images of the island big wallpapers and you're invited to sit down and to colorize my images like I did with the, the people with achromatopsia. And meanwhile, an audio 
uh, guides you through the mythology of the island. And again, mythology is something that comes back in a lot of the stories and plays an important role often in how people are perceived. And definitely in Land of Ibeji, it was, this was one of the strong foundations on which this uh, project was built. Um, with the island of the colorblind, this mythology is a story that is part of how people also explain um, certain historical events or certain perce perceptions. So on the island, there's the story of uh, uh, the typhoon that hit Pingalap, which is the island where the colorblindness originates. And um, one of the only survivors were the king and his queen, and they repopulated the island after the typhoon wiped out most of its inhabitants. And they passed on this genetic condition of which the king was carrier, which is acromatopsia. And that's how most of the Pingalapis are carrier of this gene. And um, uh, the story kind of explains how uh, colorblindness came to the island and how they in the mythology explain it is that the queen fell in love with Isopau, which is the greatest spirit of the island. And he came to visit the queen at night and the, the children they had together were half human, half ghost, and they could see better at night and they couldn't bear the daylight, which is, which is kind of explaining that acromatopsia is not only the absence of color, but what people suffer from much more is not, not to know which color they are wearing because people then try to memorize that or find solutions for that. But actually is the fact that just like people living with albinism, they're extremely light sensitive. And, and as the mythology story explains, they can hardly bear the daylight. Like on this picture is a good example of that. People squint uh, their eyes, they're constantly blinking because the light is so bright. So in these portraits, for example, I tried to explain that phenomenon where um, by, again, exposing them to the light, which also makes photography kind of an aggressive tool, I asked them to look into the light and documented how their eyes responded to that, which then uh, explains how that is actually something that you know that the light sensitivity and and the lack of of vision because they they have poor vision which can not just be solved by glasses because the cones in their eyes are missing so they cannot just adapt like other people with poor vision by wearing certain glasses but they really need different tools and different support to be able to execute certain things that for many people who don't uh, uh you know have this lack of vision can be easily executed like driving a car or something which for most people with acromatopsia without uh, support is simply not an option. Um, at the same time in this story you see the strong focus on the water on the island and um, there's a big layer also that speaks about climate change as these communities, just like the Marshall Island, which, which is maybe an example more people know of, or Kiribati, because at some point they had a, um, a government that was strongly trying to put the story out there. These super tiny island economies that have contributed very little to pollution and global warming are um, uh, going on the water. The, the, as the water is rising, their islands are sinking. And uh, as it seems very, their, their culture is very threatened because their culture of course is very much tied also to the island, living on the island the way they've been doing for centuries. There's a lot of crops, there's a lot of herbs, there's a lot of plants that you know, only exist in these places and, um, and their existence is, is, is severely threatened by climate change. Um, so that is also a layer, layer that when I speak about the work, I always try to include um, and then hoping that by creating kind of a colorful visual narrative, people will more be more likely to be drawn to the story to then understand all the complexity and all the layers that um, um, go beyond also the colorblindness, but are really um, um, to, to, to bring the conversation to a bigger perspective. And maybe I didn't really finish. <laughs> I'm, 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 <laughs> going, I'm going like I'm jumping around a bit, but actually the installation, the interactive installation where you paint is a way for color seeing people to experience the loss over color because we designed a, a, um, a light sequence that never allows you to see the true colors. So as you're painting, you don't have control over color. You don't see which colors you're using until you exit the space. And that proved to be actually a very powerful way 
to help people into a kind of empathic experience, which makes them understand what it means to not see color and then, you know, bring all the other layers in that are part of the story. Yeah, I find it super strong that you're like combining the social aspect and the social points on topics that are not uh, in the top news or not seen um, uh, widely. And um, like combining it with something everybody can deal with because like we are all trained in specific color uh, aspects or cliche stereotypes. So um, even if the topic is abroad or um, we are not using Used to see um, um, the island, for example, we can we can handle and we can connect um, with this topic. And um, I think that um, you also combined it. Then, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I thought when I um, saw the land of EBG that also like you used these somehow the terms of color and like the cultural aspects of color to get into the story also for us, for the viewer, which are not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Land of Ibeji, we were lucky because we found a book um, uh, that is called Double Trouble, Blessed Twice. And this really contained a lot of research on the topic of twinhood in West Africa. And um, uh, again, Land of Ibeji had a very specific um, entry point, let's say, because Benedict, um, uh, we made the project together, but she has been living on the continent for 15 years and, and, and Lagos has been her home for seven or eight years. So she, she has been working in the North a lot, also on stories on the Chipo girls, amongst many others, a lot of like social reporting. She also came across this story about an orphanage in Guagualada um, that was saving children that were being rejected by the community as they were born twins. Um, so there's, and it's, and it's very site specific. It's, it's, a, it's not a widespread phenomenon, but there are places in Nigeria around that area where there are still twin killings, where, where children um, are, who are born twins are being perceived as an evil spirit, or actually in, you know, the, the spiritual story goes that um, twins are very powerful spirits. And uh, the, the, the twin spirit normally resides in the heavens and not on earth. When it is born into a physical body, um, uh, through that mythological approach, people see it as a spirit that doesn't belong on earth and needs to send, be sent back to the spiritual world where, where it normally resides. Um, and that's one of the um, uh, uh, theories of where the practice comes from. But you know, Bene was very touched by this story. And when she heard me speak about my work and how a lot of my work ties into this genetics and um, uh, she felt like this, to combine our both practices, her experience in Nigeria, um, and the stories she had worked on, the knowledge she had, the people, the community, and then my approach. And I, by then, had been invited uh, to Lagos to show the island of the colorblind. So I'd been going several times. Um, uh, also for mentoring and other projects, working with the African Artists Foundation, uh, which is an amazing organization. Um, we, we thought perhaps we can try to make a story of this together, but we're very um, conscious of, or, or very, try to be very cautious of not, uh, this not becoming a story about this kind of dark side of the story, but also highlighting this bright side of the story, which is that in a lot of other places in Nigeria, for example, Igbo Ora, which is named the twin capital of the world because they have one a extremely high number of twins. Um, uh, twins are being celebrated and, and we were part of the, the first edition of the Twin Festival. And we also went to Calabar, which also is the home to the, the Twin Foundation, where uh, Mary Slesser, which was, which was a Scottish missionary, landed and she um, by example, by adopting twins, started tried to you know create interaction with the community and show that twins that there is no threat and that they are very successful that they can grow out to be very successful human beings and that there is no reason to fear or uh, reject them within the community. Um, what it was very much about for us also is when we 
you know, really dove into the story and found all of these spiritual layers to the experiencing of twins in West Africa is that we felt that in Western culture, being so focused on the materialistic, on what is on the surface, fetishizing the identical and appearance and, 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 and kind of referring twinhood almost only to that, to the, the physic appearance, which is also, of course, something that happens with people living with albinism and people in the dwarf empire. We were trying to look for a way, how can we tilt it to the spiritual perspective where you go back to the, the, the strong uh, spiritual symbol that twins are, which is twins are kind of, uh, and, and also in, in, in the West African uh, beliefs around twinhood, are like the perfect human symbiosis. It's two people that are a per two perfect halves of the circle. It's the yin and the yang. It's the dark and the light. It's the danger and the you know safety. It's the it's the sun and the moon. It's all these different things actually in this ancient mythological symbol. Because if you go back in history, you of course have Rome. You have Romulus and Remus, but you also have the star signs. You have so many spiritual symbols that seem to have a bit forgotten of how, how strong a spiritual symbol twins are and how it can also be uh, a symbol for exchange for two people coming together. I mean, I, I, in, in Lagos, uh, I also worked with two sets of twins of which one half of the twin was a person living with albinism and the other half of the twin was not. So twin can be almost the, the perfect embodiment of contrast of two completely different people being one, of two completely different cultures becoming one, of this intercultural exchange, of this um, conversation, of, of, of sometimes two opposite sides that have a really strong connection that need to find this common ground. And in Land of Ibeji, also through the colors, through the visual approach, we try to somehow translate these ideas. So how was it for I you? To... Faster than the pictures now because ah. I see you're still on the island. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so we have to uh, uh, switch from the island to the land. <laughs> um, for me, it's a question always like you are two strong authors. Um, how was it to collaborate behind the camera? Like you both were there, you both worked there, you both have your special um, a special focus. How did you develop the project together? Well, it, 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 it grew quite organically. To be honest, before the project, we didn't know each other very well. So it was <laughs> a leap of faith because it's collaboration is very beautiful. And I think also in my work, although I'm still always trying to look for, you know, the right way to, to extend collaboration in, uh, it, it's, it's something that is truly um, um, meaningful to me. And, uh, and definitely in this project, not only trying to find ways to collaborate with the people and with the orphanage and so on, it was now also the collaboration between two photographers. And um, the, the story of twinhood kind of reflected also kind of our, our personal story of how we became twins in the process of how we became sisters of how we, um, how you know, you make space for the other and, and, and the other contributes with things that maybe, you know, your flaws or, or you know, your strong points, you, you kind of become a match and you support and, and help each other and grow together. Um, and uh, uh, so in that sense, it was a really interesting experience and it is very challenging because it is complicated to be two uh, and one at the same time. But I think that's also, sometimes the experience of a twin of being two identities and then how how do you reclaim your own identity within that pair uh, how do you keep your own language and and your own you know put forward your own ideas and at the same time make space for this two the being a duo and i i think we're very lucky to have found each other in that because it, I've, i've you know I'm really pro collaboration, but it's not always easy to find someone that you can successfully collaborate with. Um, and and in, in that sense, I think this was also a very valuable process for both of us on a personal level. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't suffer so much from our own ego that is difficult <laughs> to put it aside um, to collaborate on this together. So we really also completely merged 
the photography, the work, it's our work. No one will ever know who took which image or, I mean, we were also, some of the images we were shooting separately, but in the same, you know, around the same topic. Sometimes an image is really made together. Some One person does the light, other person takes the picture. And so it's just, uh, yeah, it's a mix of all those elements. This sounds great. And as well uh, as a like naturally uh, developing a story. Um, so I, I ask myself like, um, like do this, the topics are coming like they find you or um, is, is there uh, any time like an external hint where you can say, okay, this is now uh, the next one. And how do you combine like these long-term projects um, as you talked about now and uh, also, like, uh, it would be another question how you combine it with um, your more daily work at the Volkskrant, maybe? Um. Well, you know, Corona, or the COVID situation has hit me just like <laughs> when I think. So I, I did my first shoot since February, uh, day before yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I have plenty of unfinished work because I've been really working very hard these past years and there's a lot of things I never had time to finish properly or there's a lot of things uh, I can work on so but uh, yeah let's say that um, on, on daily basis um, 2020 also economically for me kind of completely died because all our exhibitions were cancelled all talks workshops I mean we're here now, but normally we would have been in one space together, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, in in as a as an answer to your questions on how I get to the stories, I think as I explained a little bit with Snow White, it happened because I, I had an assignment for school and, and I met a person and that triggered something in me that I felt I had to pursue. And um with the dwarf empire, it was very simple. It was an image on Facebook where I saw <laughs> Uh, two two people uh, like tourists pose with a little person a person of short stature in China and um, uh, uh, I was just within that one image I felt the entire power construct of the photography as a tool this um, you know awkwardness of being taller and, and shorter and how to deal with that within an image the the strange you know the the, the kind of almost violent approach of tourism sometimes ending up in that kind of situation wondering how people then feel about it and and that's that was just the one image that triggered me and then i started trying to find you know to see if i could go to that place with the island as i said it was because someone actually told me about it sent me an email and said can we talk i think i have a story for you and and that person then also contributed to the book later on and and with landa vibeji it was uh, uh was a friend of benedict had written an article for the abuja times and she just felt like there was much more to the story than just this article about the orphanage and about the uh, infanticide um so I think, yeah, in terms of long term, all my projects are constantly still developing and never ending. Like I was supposed to go to the island in March to make my first film uh, about the island of the colorblind. And uh, it's still a bit unclear if that will still happen or not. So I'm a little bit sad um, because I really, really want to see the family again. Um, but yeah. Uh, all my work, I think, has been going on for many years and feels like it's never finished because also the language is changing, the conversation is changing, the needs is changing, the approach is changing. So the work is never done. <laughs> this is a, like, a, yeah, it, it sums up everything. Like um, you, you um, said by yourself that like you uh, have to throw yourself into it uh, to, to get your project. I, I read it somewhere. And um, I, f I find it uh, totally perfect to um, define um, these uh, these life between uh, like a freelancer life and topic that like um, go with you for years or for decades maybe. And um, being like as well in two worlds, like being on assignment you mentioned and um, as well like um, dealing with the free projects because we have a lot of young photojournalists and journalists uh, at the festival so um, I would be interesting to to know a bit about um, how you organize it like pre-corona um, is it something mask I just realized oh. that <laughs> 
how I organize also the, because yeah, maybe that's something to still mention. Uh, of course, these personal projects, they allow much more to go in depth and to really, um, you know, find a layered way and a nuanced way to try and tell a story. While working for the newspaper, I mean, I'm very grateful for all the opportunities they've given me and I do really enjoy because sometimes my work goes on so endlessly. Uh, sometimes it's nice to do something that has a fast deadline that and then you move on from that. And also the thing is in your personal work, the responsibility is much bigger. Uh, working for a newspaper, uh, often the stories are not stories you chose. At the same time, that also means that you often need to compromise, which is not always easy. So, you know, after some years, that sometimes also becomes a struggle if you, for example, don't agree with the approach of us or, or the way a certain story has is being told. Like I think the media plays a very important role in storytelling, but sadly, there's also a lot of, uh, you know, the stereotypical narrative. There's a lot of, um, yeah, conditioned thinking and narrating also within the media, uh, which is sometimes difficult as a freelancer photographer to really put your foot down and change those things because it's such a big beast, let's say, right? A newspaper is an organization with so many people, uh, with so many opinions, with so many, and, and, and the time pressure is always so uh, high. Like there's never a lot of time to work on a story or to look back or to, um, so it's, yeah, it's a very different way of working and I've enjoyed it a lot also, but the last years, I mean, it just became harder and harder to also combine my personal work with uh, assignment work. And if I can, I try to do more, even in assignments, a bit more long-term commissions or I've been doing things for commissions for museums or what I, I also started teaching, which in the beginning I, I felt weird about because I felt like I only graduated a few years ago. So how can I be teaching people that sometimes are even older than I am? Um, uh, but I do very much believe in the conversation and in the exchange and in learning from each other. So I think recently my work also started changing a little bit and started including much more speaking about my work and, and doing workshops with Noor and, um, and, and doing assignments in between, but I cannot combine with my personal work anymore to do the assignments on a daily basis or to be called on the day itself and to rush out and, uh, and um, yeah, that, that is not possible anymore. Although maybe now Corona will free up all that space. Now everything else disappears and I'll have to go running again. Mm -hmm. uh, you have such a lot of inspirations through the different channels you mentioned already. So I'm sure uh, you will make the best out of it, even if um, you're running maybe on the daily base. But I think, um, yeah, it will go on. And like your work is like, um, and you, you mentioned it, it's, uh, it will net not end. Um, it's, it's still present and it's still on show. It was uh, on such a lot of photo festivals and you also um, uh, get a lot of different, um, uh, yeah, like a lot of uh, uh, different people that are seeing your work, like you're, you're using the book. It's a wonderful book. It's sold out, I saw, <laughs> uh, for the land of the color, island of the colorblind. Um, you're using the uh, exhibitions, the installations, um, articles. So um, then we now in the uh, online age where we have like videos and so on. So there are also a lot of external demands on how to present something. And I think you are a, a very good uh, example of how to deal with all these kind of demands yourself and um, also the external ones. And um, how to, yeah, how um, to like, you stay also true to what you want to tell, like uh, it's every time your story. So um, I think this is um, um, the big, uh, the big knot everybody wants to <laughs> open up uh, in his work. Um, I will see if we have still some questions from the audience uh, in my chat box. Um, so feel free to ask Zana to use the chance to um, ask her something if you have still a question. I, I just opened the chat now. So I see, yes. I see this question, the question of being feeling the urgency to be a social worker. And it's a really good question. Yes. I think it's, it's something I struggle with 
continuously. As, as I said, like I've been running around for years trying to make a living and surviving through photography and having very little time to stand still or to, uh, yeah, I feel it's, 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 a, yeah, it's continuously on my mind to think how can you do more or definitely because I work around topics with community that often need support at the same time. I am a photographer and not a social worker. So I try to find the balance somehow and sometimes feel like I completely fail, like thinking we, we should do much more and, and much more of our efforts should go to giving back to the community. And, and uh, for me, it is very important to go back to a story, to go back to people, to stay in touch with people. And, and I have a lot of loving experience, but sometimes again, also struggle with how difficult it is to like organize more of structural or long-term uh, support for the people that which stories I tried to bring to the light. For example, um, with the story in Nigeria, we're still really looking for a way to set up funding for the orphanage or something because it's a it's a place that is run by two missionaries with very little resources the children are very malnourished and very love deprived there's a lot of children in a small space and 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 it's just sometimes it's hard because we can you know I don't know barely right now <laughs> make our own uh, situation work or, or um, but yeah I think the first step, I guess, is to try and bring people together. And, and like I try to do with the work on albinism, to try and create kind of a platform and also then have the people in charge of that. That's, for example, why with the panel, I am not part of the conversation, but I tried to create the, the, the space for it somehow with help of, of other supporting organizations. With the people on the island, I asked for support of an... Um, of a, of a really lovely optician in the Netherlands, a lady who went around to the the, the, the stores who sell sunglasses so I could go with a big backpack of sunglasses. Obviously that's not enough, but when I speak to, or to the organization here, the people with achromatopsia, for example, because people in, in Europe, they have access to tinted lenses, which allow them to function uh, in, in the daylight. So they can actually keep their eyes fully open, which is super helpful. But when I spoke to the organization here and, and, and I said, shouldn't, we, shouldn't I try to get someone to sponsor, to bring those lenses? And they said, if there's not the infrastructure for it to do that long-term, people's eyes can get infected if it's not well maintained or explained. And then my resources are so little, I can only go to the island when someone assigns me to because I can't afford to go otherwise. Then I have this short amount of time and also not the skills to really set up a medical center or a branch in the medical center that can provide this long term with sponsorship. Like the first time that my work was actually funded was with Land of Ibeji because we got a Nikon grant. Besides that, I've always been funding my own work just from money I make with assignments. So I think, yeah, it's, it, that is also a lifetime work to see how you can make more sustainable structures or how you can be of more support also financially somehow to the, 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 the people or the communities that you work with. Very and, important thing. And there's... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, there's another, another question um um beside that and um it says would you say that you experience it different as a woman working in the field of photography so. um i mean it's a difficult question because i think as a photographer we try to minimize the differences to be able to function in that world that was very male oriented so um, I, I have not often felt very, um, um, yeah, felt more, maybe I didn't feel more limited in my abilities as being a woman. Of course, we all get into situations where sometimes men want to help you with a project or something until you then say you don't feel like meeting them, you know, in private and then they don't want to help you anymore. And uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think those are experiences everyone uh, has, but I think I've been very lucky in that regards because I have other colleagues who have, you know, I, I know of women photographers who've been raped during the work they're doing and it's 
yeah, that is of course something that I, I hear less men being exposed to that kind of danger and it's a life-changing experience. So I praise myself very lucky that I've never um, had that kind of situation um, overcome me somehow. And I've been very lucky to be very warmly welcomed by the communities that I've worked with and always felt very protected by them. Um, I mean, I think the situation will change very much when I will want to have a child and then find that it would make, make me so much less um, uh, able to do this kind of work and to be long, to be gone for long periods of time or to, you know, be more, um, to, to travel and work like that. I think that, and, and, and yeah, there is not really a, a sustainable solution for that either. There is not really a structure that allows you to, take maternal leave as a freelancer and have time and support for that. Um, so yeah, that will influence my life and my work. But as so many other women photographers, I think everyone tries to find a way to work around that. Yeah, like the individual ones and also like platforms. We had uh, earlier this day, Charlotte Schmitz, who's like part of woman photo uh, photograph. And um, like um, there are like structures, even you received the uh, uh, PH Woman Grant and the Firecracker Award. I think these are uh, um, important parts uh, to, to do something or like, is it something else? Then uh, I don't know, the WordPress Photo Award, but uh, like it's, well, the World Press Photo Award is more exposure than it is specific. I mean, it's it's support in terms of exposure. But then again, it's also a very compli complicated platform also to me because, you know, you feel like it still needs to change a lot to, to be in the current contemporary scene. And my work has always been a little bit in between. I mean, it's completely documentary based because everything, I mean, I, do, I don't do... I don't alter my images in Photoshop or everything is, you know, from a real situation, but it is also a little bit on the art side. Like it's not photojournalism either. Um, I think it's more in terms of, yeah, not so much a grant, but a different approach. Like for example, how Noor tries to, when they have a, a single mom teaching, tries to get a babysit fee for the photographer because it's simply a reality if you don't have that infrastructure at home that allows you to do those kind of things otherwise you simply cannot work so i think it's more in that perspective that as i said like maternity leave or, or more structural support or understanding for yeah the the position as a woman so like more the everyday structure like how, yeah, how to also deal with for example when we're talking about uh, a photographer that had a, you know has, has experienced sexual violence in the field I think there's a big taboo to actually tell that to people simply because people don't want to be seen as fragile or uh, be not be able to cover stories because they're a woman that they feel may be very strongly connected to so I think it's also yeah creating that understanding for people to be able to show, to be honest about those kind of situations, but at the same time, not be, yeah, to be empowered without being disempowered while trying to be empowered. I mean, it's always, <laughs> it's always such a, a difficult structure because, yeah, it's just a balancing act. And not like everything is equal, but in the difference, um, there's not, the, we should not be excluded. Yes. Like, um, Maybe we can sum it up like this somehow. Um, so I would uh, have a look in the Q&A box, maybe because the time is now uh, going fast. If there is some, some other questions. Shirin, but the question about the flash for the Snow White portraits. <laughs> and I did use a flash because I wanted to play with this photographic element of the light and um, it is difficult for them to bear the light. So it is also difficult. I mean, this was like a conceptual approach for the portraits and at the same time, I don't want to harm or hurt people. So usually it's a session where they, they rest their eyes in between and I ask them to clearly indicate when 
their eyes are getting tired, which is also what happens when they're outside, like the light is just tiring. So it helps for them to in between close their eyes, rest. And also that is part of the images. A lot of the portraits are with closed eyes or half closed eyes, which is also literally a translation of the fact they can, they have problems bearing the light. So I want, it's almost a literal visual translation of that part. Okay. Now we have the, <laughs> um, the answer for this question, I think. We all answered them, maybe, yes. So, yes, I, I've, you had like, in, this were incredible insights uh, to your thoughts, to your way of work, to all these uh, ends of different uh, <laughs> different uh, sides you combine. Um, it's a great thing. Um, it's a, like a, such a you throw yourself into it really. Um, so I'm very grateful and thank you, Zana, for the thank talk. You so much for having me. Yeah, thank you, Mia. Also for my side, thank you, Zana. For me, it's been incredibly interesting and I never knew before that you studied painting at the beginning. And when I today came to our university place, I thought I'd like to ask you what photography works best for you. And you know, you just answered it right from the beginning because I think I can really see it in your photography that somehow you have a background in painting or maybe other media. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting. And I really liked how you build it a bridge to um, the idea of equality, diversity. Um, so thank you very much for joining. And I hope now the stress goes down because Sanne had to catch the train and it was late and everything. So we made it perfectly in time. So, okay. Tomorrow we focus on um, ethics and power relations in photography, another very important topic. And tomorrow is already our last day. So stay with us and follow the last day and see what kind of interesting insights we have prepared for you. I've got one thing to disappoint you for all the ones who wanted to attend the um, live talk tomorrow, because we have to cancel that because of some health issues. But we hopefully will be able to um, yeah, show it to a later point of time. So stay connected with us and maybe you... Um, get our newsletter, then we will inform you um, at what date we maybe um, can reschedule uh, the live talk for tomorrow about power in photography. And thank you all for attending. Thank you for Seven a Photo Agency for hosting all these webinars. And if you have a look at the chat, the ones who've been with us um, have seen it before, they have a special um, discount code if you'd like to attend their workshops. So we post this. Um, yeah, so I try this now. Okay, now you have it. So thank you all. Have a nice afternoon, a good evening, and um, see you later one day. Bye-bye. <laughs>